Hello! So, uh, this is a bit of a different video for this channel, uh, because I'm going to be talking about a book that I've already read. A book, uh, that I finished, in fact, quite a while ago. <clears throat> and that book is Gideon the Ninth by Tamsin Muir. Um, so, I read this book about a year ago, a little under a year ago, uh, I, this channel was already well underway. I believe I read it in between, either between The Final Empire and, and uh, Well of Ascension, or between Well of Ascension and Hero of Ages. I can't quite remember between which two, but definitely while I was reading Mistborn Era 1. Um, and I really enjoyed the book. And when I started the book, I intended to maybe make videos about it, but as I was... I realized that at least at the time, with the way my videos were constructed at the time, I didn't really have much to say um, about that book. And also, I wasn't sure if I really wanted to do non-Cosmere stuff on the channel, uh, but now I'm sure. Now I've decided that I'm really just going to make videos about pretty much any book I read, um, because that way I don't, f uh, because that way I won't feel sort of this pressure that I sometimes felt during this past year of when I was reading something that wasn't for the channel, I sometimes felt a bit like, oh, I, like, what if I run out of backlog for the channel or whatever? So, no, I don't want to worry about that anymore. So, and this channel is never going to be big, nor is that my goal. So I don't need to chase after popular books or whatever. I'm going to read what I want to read. Uh, and what I want to read now is this. Harrow the Ninth, the second book in the Locked Tomb series. Uh, I've already started. I'm about two chapters in, very early on in the book. But I realized that if I wanted to make videos about this book... I should probably make a brief video just talking about the first book and what I thought about it. So that people knew uh, my thoughts going into this book, as it were. <clears throat> so, Gideon the Ninth. Uh, when I started reading Gideon the Ninth, I knew very little about it. All I knew was like the sort of memefied. uh blurb that was on the on the cover of the book which was lesbian necromancers in space uh and uh and you know i am someone who has a bit of a, a bit of a fascination with necromancy in fiction it's actually something that i feel is massively underutilized in a lot of fantasy and i'm always interested in sort of unique takes on necromancy um, and this is certainly a unique take on necromancy. <clears throat> and I also really love the melding of science fiction and fantasy. The idea of necromancers in space was deeply intriguing to me. Um, and of course, I'm always a sucker for uh, a good queer romance or, or, in general, queer characters in books. So... Uh, the lesbian part was also appealing. Um, so, the blurb, while very simplistic and, like I said, kind of memefied, uh, was something that got me interested in this book. And I had sort of peripherally, <clears throat> peripherally been, um, I'd seen the periphery of the fandom on Tumblr for this book for several years, because I follow certain people who are big fans of this book. Um... <clears throat> But nothing really concrete about the book ever really got to me. So really all I knew going in was that that's what the book was. Lesbian necromancers in space. And boy, was I not prepared for what the book actually was. Uh, so, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. So, the first thing that I need to say about this book is that I don't have that much to say about the actual plot or events of this book, or even about the book's themes, such as they are, um, because I don't think that's what the book really was about. 
there was some stuff there that was interesting, but the main appeal of this book, in my opinion, is the characters and, rather uniquely, the, the storytelling and writing style and the tone of the story. Now, I have it on good authority from people who've read both that there is some influence in regards to the tone and writing style of this book from Homestuck, which I'm not very familiar with. Uh, but, uh, but from what little I know of it, that does seem to be true, because this book has this fascinating blend of incredibly, uh, like, I want to say purple prose, but that kind of seems like a bad thing. When I say purple prose, I mean, in this case, like, incredibly advanced vocabulary and fancy ways of saying things, not out of pretension, but because it kind of suits the tone and the characters. Uh, so that is mixed with sort of a very modern slang-filled uh, way of speech for other characters, especially Gideon. Uh, and this bizarre linguistic combination is layered on top of a story that veers back and forth from slapstick comedy to horrifying gore and horror. Um, with, like, incredible violence. And, and nightmarish concepts being explored. Uh, so it's, it's kind of this roller coaster, tonally speaking, of, uh, in, of like constant humor, but also constant darkness. Uh, if, it, if, if, it, if this were written in a different style, the events of this book would absolutely qualify this book for the grim dark subgenre. But I don't think anyone really considers it that um, because of the tone, which is so irreverent and, 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 and humorous. Um, and this is by no means a comedy. That's the thing. It's a very serious book about very serious events that just has this constant edge of irony and, uh, and sarcasm and humor uh, that really is something I've never experienced before in a book. It's, it's, a, it's a combination that I've never seen. Uh, so I want to commend Tamsin Muir for uh, creating a truly unique blend of, of, of tonal... I was about to say tonal tones. That's not a thing. Uh, a, a truly unique blend of tones uh, for this book. Um, that being said, though, the prose is phenomenal the tone is unique and the but the but the other thing about this book that's noteworthy is that it is incredibly hard to read and what i mean by that is not that the events are stomach churning at times which they are but that the way it is written makes it very difficult to sometimes follow what is happening and I think that's on purpose. This is a book that expects you to pay attention. There are paragraphs and pages and entire chapters I had to reread in order to fully grasp what happened when I was reading this book. Um, and this is not a criticism. I think this is very much on purpose, and I think it will, it's handled really well. And I, I enjoy, for a change, <clears throat> having to sort of use 100% of my brain in order to follow what is happening in a book. <clears throat> That's not something that, uh, that I've really experienced in a while. Um, th there were some parts of Stormlight Archive that were like that, uh, but not, not very many. It, it only happened occasionally, whereas here it's like the whole book is like that. A description of something as ordinary as someone's day-to-day -day life is written in such a way that you aren't really seeing it as though you're seeing it through a camera. You're seeing it through that person's thoughts, through the narrator's thoughts and impressions and feelings and so forth. And that filter makes the whole thing kind of blurry, I guess. 
Um, anyway, that's, a, that, that, that's, that's all I really have to say about the style of the book. Uh, like I said, the plot of the book, I don't have much to say. It was fine. It, it combined elements from murder mysteries, uh, battle royale stories like the Hunger Games, uh, there's elements of, of, of high fantasy, there's elements of space opera, um, and the magic system is fascinating because, like I said, it's necromancy, and it's a very, very, very clearly a super hard magic system. Like, there are... It's, it's, it's a science, really. It's more, more science than magic. But, even by the end of the book, I, as the reader, am not really privy to the mechanics of that hard magic system. I have to sort of put them together from context clues. And that's in part because Gideon herself, our narrator, is not a necromancer. She doesn't know. She also only has contextual information about how necromancy works. Which is not something I expected. You, you know, uh, I, I kind of assumed, based on the, on the cover page where we have Gideon surrounded by skeletons that she herself was a necromancer but no she's 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 hired muscle she's a uh, she's a meathead she's a jock and kind of an idiot and i love her uh, but now i'm getting into characters um oh yeah by the way the cover art for gideon the ninth is the perfect illustration of the tonal dissonance and bizarre vibes of this book because in case you haven't seen the cover, you have it in the thumbnail. Um, there's Gideon with, like, a, a fantasy giant two-handed sword surrounded by skeletons in this, like, incredibly grim and dark scene of, like, gothic horror. And she has a skull painted on her face <clears throat> and all that. And then she's wearing sunglasses, <laughs> which just adds, like, a level of absurdity to the whole image. And that's exactly what the experience of reading this book is. That is, it's probably one of the most fitting and representative covers of any book I've ever seen. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so, um... The world building in general is very vague, but vague in the sense that I, I, I can clearly tell that Tamsin Muir knows exactly what this world is. The world is built out to fine detail. It's not a case of her being vague because she hasn't made up her mind about stuff or doesn't or, or hasn't like fully created the world. No, she's being vague because there are things that Gideon doesn't know. And there are other things which Gideon does know about this setting, but which just aren't relevant to her at the moment, and so she never thinks about them. And so a ton of the world building you have to put together through context clues, uh, which is which is fun. I, I, I enjoy writing like that. I think it's very difficult to write like that. I don't know if I could ever pull it off. But I do think it is very impressive when handled well, and I do think Tamsin Weir handles it well. <clears throat> Okay, now I'm going to talk about a couple of the characters, and at this point, from this point forward in the video, expect full spoilers for Gideon the Ninth. Uh, not for any future books, I haven't read future books, so I don't know anything, uh, other than the first two chapters of Harrow, but I'm not going to talk about those in this video either. But full spoilers for Gideon the Ninth, up to and including the ending. So, the main characters of this story are obviously Gideon and Harrow, and... They are really, really unique and interesting character archetypes. Uh, Gideon is, like I said, a bit of a meathead and a jock. She's very intelligent and very clever, but she uses her intellect and cleverness really only to make fun of people and to be a dick sometimes. She is not interested in in solving mysteries, she is not interested in academic pursuits, she is not interested in really much of anything except sort of base 
uh, very base desires, like mock, like mocking people she doesn't like, being a dick to Harrow. Very deservedly, by the way. Harrow absolutely earned that. <clears throat> uh, and, and, and and obviously survival and getting through this whole thing unscathed. Uh, these are the sorts of things that drive Gideon, which makes her unique among the characters, because pretty much every character in this story has these nuanced, complex, uh, interesting motivations, except the main character. The main character is shockingly straightforward in her motives, up until the end when things suddenly change. So... I feel like I will eventually need to reread Gideon the Ninth in order to fully appreciate Gideon as a character. Um, because when the ending came, and when she sacrifices herself for Harrow, <clears throat> it didn't make a ton of sense to me at the time. And now in hindsight, when I look back at the book, I have this vague feeling that it did make sense, but I'm not sure why. So I'm not sure, still, how I feel about Gideon's choice at the end there. Because I'm still not sure if it makes sense. And the reason I'm not sure is because Gideon's characterization, much like everything else in this book, is given to us very indirectly. And there's a lot of subtle context clues you have to pick up on throughout. Um, so for now I will just say that Gideon is a joy to read as a protagonist. Uh, and also very frustrating to read, because obviously this is kind of a mystery story, and as a reader you want to solve the mystery, and Gideon is profoundly disinterested in the mystery for most of this book, uh, which is very frustrating for you as the reader, but it's fully in character for her. So that was kind of a fun, uh, a fun subversion, telling a mystery story through the point of view of someone who doesn't really care about the mystery. Um, and, and that's kind of the interesting thing about Gideon the Ninth, is that Gideon isn't really the protagonist. I mean, she is, in that she's the point of view character that we're meant to relate to, but if you were to look at the events of this story from a distance, Harrow is just as much, if not more, the protagonist, in terms of actively engaging with the plot and actively doing stuff, often off-screen without Gideon's knowledge uh, that actually moves the plot forward. And one thing I was I kind of thought going into Harrow the Ninth, which I've now started reading, like I said, is that Harrow the Ninth might end up being essentially the first book but retold from Harrow's point of view, because that felt like something that absolutely there was potential for. Like, it felt like Harrow had a whole arc that happened mostly off-screen in the first book. Um, but no, that doesn't appear to be the case. Harrow the Ninth is actually a sequel. Uh, but hopefully it will, it will flesh out some of the events of the first book from Harrow's perspective as well. Um, but yeah, that actually brings us to Harrow. So Harrow is probably the most complex character here. Uh, her backstory is almost cartoonishly dark and over the top, but in a way that fits with this book's somewhat cartoonish and over the top vibe. I mean, it's about necromancers in space. It's extremely... Like, the whole story is very gothic in, and, and melodramatic and romantic. Not romantic in, like, the sense of romance, but in the sense of, like, romanticism, like Lord Byron romantic. Um, anyway, uh, so Harrow's backstory is that she found out that her parents sacrificed a generation of children in order for her to be born... And then she committed the greatest sin of her culture by opening the locked tomb and falling in love with the corpse in there, which immediately the most gothic sentence imaginable. Like, whenever there's a story where someone falls in love with a beautiful corpse, it, it just makes me laugh because it's like, 
it's a cliche, but it's a cliche for a reason uh, within this genre of gothic fiction, I think. Um, and then her parents commit suicide and she's pretended and she's been pretending that they're still alive since she was a child. Like, it's so over the top and melodramatic uh, that, but it needs to be. And the reason it needs to be over the top and melodramatic is that we have to be able to have some sympathy for Harrow despite the horrific things she's put Gideon through. Because, of course, we're, we're seeing this from Gideon's perspective. And from Gideon's perspective, up until all these reveals, Harrow is like an inhuman monster of a person. She is, uh, she, she is horrible to Gideon. Um, and I don't want to say that this excuses any of her treatment of Gideon at all, but because it's so over the top, it's sort of in the reader's brain, and I think in Gideon's brain, kind of overwhelms our emotional response to her treatment of Gideon. It's a bit emotionally manipulative, I think, on, on, on Weir's part. Uh, but I'll allow it. Um, the relationship such as it is between Harrow and Gideon would not be a healthy or good one in real life. Uh, but in fiction, sometimes a very toxic and fucked up relationship can be fun to explore as well. Uh, so I don't mind that particular element of it. It's, it's, it's an enjoyable train wreck of a relationship. Um... What else is there really to talk about here? Uh, yeah, the other... So, so there are other characters in this book, and I don't feel like I need to talk about them because, frankly, the majority of them are dead by the end of the book. Uh, so going forward, my thoughts on them won't matter that much. Uh, Ianthe is alive, but she was never particularly compelling to me. Uh, maybe she will be in the second book. Um, the other living character is the... The Cavalier of the Sixth, whose name I can't remember and who also wasn't particularly interesting. Uh, all the really interesting characters actually are dead. Uh, so Cytheria, Jean-Marie, Isaac, uh, these are the characters that I really sort of um, felt a connection to in this book, other than the main two. Uh, and in particular, I want to say that Jean-Marie and Isaac's deaths were... Surprising. Not just because they are children, and usually fiction won't go out of its way to brutally, gruesomely murder children the way that Muir does to these two children, but also because those two characters felt so developed and so interesting and so compelling that, it, that I felt certain that if anyone from this book was going to carry forward and be a more developed character in the future, it would be those two. And it feels like a bit of a... A bit of a shame, really, that we didn't get more uh, more Jean-Marie and Isaac, because they, they were such cool characters in the first book. Um, <clears throat> so that was sort of my one big disappointment of the first book. Um, the other big disappointment of the first book to me is that I don't really feel like the book had a ton of themes other than love. And when I say love, I don't mean in a cliché way, I mean in actually a very nuanced way. This book is about strong emotional bonds of different kinds. One of the major themes of the book, really the only thing I would categorize as, like, distinct, uh, distinctly a theme throughout the book, is the wildly different relationships that exist between cavaliers and their necromancers, some of which are very healthy and wholesome, some of which are very toxic, and some of which are somewhere in between. Some of which are romantic or sexual, some of which are familial, some of which are master-servant relationships, some of which are strictly professional, but all of which are incredibly intense relationships. And I think that's, I think one of the things that maybe Tamsin Muir wanted to explore with this book is the different kinds of incredibly intense interpersonal relationships that people can develop. 
and how sometimes what matters more is the intensity of the relationship and not necessarily the actual nature of the relationship. Um, essentially, hating someone very intensely can be closer to loving them intensely than than it is to just kind of disliking them but not very but not very strongly if that makes sense um at least that's how i interpret maybe the sort of thematic core of the book um we'll see if i'm right in the second book uh and speaking of the second book i'd like to end this video by giving some basic predictions sort of what i think is gonna go on in this book uh obviously I have read two chapters of this book, so I do know a bit, uh, but I'm going to give my predictions as they were before I started reading this, actually. And I'm not going to give away which ones have already been disproven. So first of all, uh, obviously, I don't, it, it's not, I mean, yes, this one has been confirmed. This book is from Harrow's perspective. That's obvious from the title. Uh, but one thing I know about this book going in one thing that I've been told by people who've read it is that this book is even more difficult to follow than the first and that some people have said that, like, for the first two-thirds of this book, they had no idea what was going on. And that only towards the end did they start to actually understand the actual plot of the book. Uh, so I'm very excited for that because that was one of my favorite elements of the first book, that, like, the, the fact that you kind of had to figure out what the book was about on your own. I really enjoyed that. It's not for everyone, but it is for me. Um, secondly, I expect that this book might be a bit lighter on the humor and a bit heavier on the darkness and edginess, if you will, simply because it's about Harrow and not Gideon. And Harrow is... Harrow has less of a sense of humor than Gideon. Uh, now, I will note that the back of this book has the, has the sentence, The necromancers are back, and they're gayer than ever. Which I have some questions about. Is, is, is Harrow going to get a new girlfriend in this book? Or is she just going to pine after Gideon? I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that could be referring to, considering one of one of the two one of the halves of our main couple is dead. Um, I also expect this book to have a much more interesting plot than the first one. The first one, like I said, is just kind of a collection of tropes from different from different media, in my opinion. Uh, like sort of a Hunger Games meets Agatha Christie, basically. But this book. I suspect, at least based on how the first book ends and based on the fact that Harrow is now going to be in service to the Emperor, I think this book is going to have a premise maybe more unique to this setting and more, um, more tied to the deep lore going on here. So I'm looking forward to that and I'm looking forward to the deeper world building that I'm hoping will happen here. Because much as I love the vague world building of the first book, I would now like to actually get some concrete information about this world. Um, what else do I expect? Well, considering the book is about Harrow, maybe by the end of this book, Harrow will open the locked tomb, because that seems like where her story is, is sort of heading naturally, like the natural terminus of her story. Um, so I'm looking forward to maybe that happening. Um, and I also expect that by the end of this book, I will probably know who Nona and Electo are, because I know that the third and fourth books are called Nona the Ninth and Electo the Ninth, and as of right now, I don't know who those people are. There has not been any mention of those two names in the first book, as far as I remember, at all. So I'm quite curious to see if by the end of this book, I will actually be able to predict more about who the next two books are about. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I have to say about this book. Um, about my predictions for this book, rather. Uh, I will see you 
in the near future when I read the first big chunk of this book. I don't know how much that will be. Uh, I haven't really decided how I'm going to split this book up. I haven't even really looked at the credits or anything. Uh, if this book is split into five acts, like the first book, then maybe I'll make five videos, one for each act. We'll see. Um, but yeah, those were my thoughts on Gideon the Ninth, and some of my thoughts going into Harrow the Ninth. I will see you next time for probably Harrow the Ninth Act One. See ya.